welcome to the Pop Cult Podcast. Here are your hosts Ariana and Seth. I'm Seth. I'm Ariana. And this is the Pop Cult Podcast. Today, we're going to be focusing on filmmaker Tim Burton. A little later, we're going to be talking about one of his more recent films, Miss Peregrine's School for Fucking Weird Kids. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Kill your children. Yeah, I forgot. It's a long name. Uh, but first, we're going to be talking about the original Beetlejuice. Uh, most of you listening are probably familiar with Beetlejuice. Uh, came out in 1988, was Tim Burton's second feature film after Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Uh, starred Michael Keaton alongside Gina Davis, Alec Baldwin, uh, Catherine O'Hara, Winona Ryder, Jeffrey Jones, uh, Glenn Shaddix, the late Glenn Shaddix. Uh, after, the plot is that after Barbara and Adam, the Davis and Baldwin, die in a car accident, they find themselves stuck haunting their country residence, unable to leave the house. When the unbearable Dietzes... O'Hara, Jones, and their teen daughter, Ryder, uh, by the home, the Maitlands attempt to scare them away without success. Their efforts attract Beetlejuice, Keaton, a rambunctious spirit whose help quickly becomes dangerous for the Maitlands and innocent Lydia. So, Ariana, this was a movie I have seen several times, and I'm going to assume you have probably watched several times starting in childhood. Yes. Uh, so we were very familiar with Beetlejuice coming into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking back at the movie now, does it stand up to your memories of it? Is it still a good movie? Is it a total disaster? What do you think? I think it's a mixed bag, right? There is this sense of nostalgia towards it, but I think the only film that I've ever had a strong nostalgia feel was Adam Family 2. Adam's Family Values? Yeah. That's the film that really got to me and even still makes me laugh. And I would say those films, even though they're directed by Barry Sonnenfeld, clearly wouldn't have happened if Tim Burton hadn't been successful. Yes. And um, this was... There's a lot of things that are good about the film. I think Gina Davis does an amazing job. Um... Alec Baldwin, you don't like you and like I love how I've seen online with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice being out. A lot of people didn't realize that was Alec Baldwin. <laughs> he does, he has <laughs> physically changed over time. Yes, and it's also he's wearing glasses. He's kind of playing a character he doesn't really play that often. Yeah. He's more soft spoken. Yeah, and a nerdy type of guy. Um and it's also like this thing that we realize with Burton films, it's the lulling into the weird right it's let's go through uh let we're going to let you see what day-to-day life looks like through this uh the lens of this family before we get into the weird parts which are supposed to be the most fun parts right it's it's teasing you and it's building up towards something yeah side note if we remade beetlejuice i have an idea of who i might cast as the maitlands Uh uh-huh in a new version uh for Adam, uh-huh. John Hamm. Yeah. For Barbara, uh-huh. Kristen Wig. Okay. Yeah. I think that like you think because they were in Bridesmaids together. Yeah. And I feel like they could play off each other well as like this married couple. I don't And of course so. Millie Bobby Brown is Lydia, right? <laughs> oh, um, but I think it also there's such great highs about it, but then there's also parts that are missing, I think, story wise. Um, I kind of just have a question as to the relationship between like the mainlands and uh Lydia because it's just supposed to be like, oh, suddenly they're close. Suddenly well, it's they're you because know. she can see them, she's close to death. Yeah. And it's just kind of she doesn't really want to be there and they don't want the Dietzes there, so there's a mutual goal that's shared. Yeah, and I think it's also it's supposed to be Oh, this was a couple that wanted to have a child. Yeah. That they wanted to have a child and now and they have a child living in their home. And that's a very subtle plot point. Yes. It's, and it's something I don't hear anybody ever really talk about is, yeah, that relationship coming out of the conversation they have earlier about, oh, we've tried, but it never happened. Yes. And... and it's this weird thing that, like, 
I wish they would have like indulged us a little bit to just be like, oh, the they are becoming the actual parents that Lydia wants versus her biological parents but then it's it's not mean-spirited enough to like kill off her parents yeah they're still around but it's also like this thing of it being like she calls her mother by her first name but it's not her mother it's her stepmother it, it, does she say it's her step-mother? she says yes okay, when yeah, the yeah. maitlands they go they mention something about your mother and she go, corrects them and goes stepmother yeah but there's never a conversation my reading of it is that Lydia's mother died. Yeah. Which is what has made Lydia become this kind of goth, death obsessed little girl. Yeah. And that's also what makes her sensitive to seeing the Maitlands as she yeah. was touched by death and it affected her in a profound way. Yeah. And there's never an explanation as to what age that happened. Not that it's important, but it's just also just there's a skimming of sorts. Well, but it's that good thing that I do like about older movies that they didn't feel the need to give you a you know, an hour of backstory to understand yeah. everybody. It was just, give me the basics, paint a broad picture. I'll fill in the details myself. Yeah. Um, I think it's also like, I have a bit of a problem with trying to understand why it is that, uh, like Delia and Charles, Charles are together are in a okay, relationship together. Um, cause she's a sculptor. Yes, yeah, she's an artsy type of person, and I don't. He's just a rich man that really wants to get out of New York. But here's the thing: I can see how they might have met, and again, it's it's implied by their various roles. A lot of wealthy people in the 1980s were investing this, you know, avalanche of money they were making off of Reagan's economy, yeah, and buying art because it's a good way to like hide your money, right? Yeah. So I would imagine he was at some, you know, art gallery opening. He meets Delia. He's charmed by something about her. They end up together. But the longer they get to know each other, the more real aspects of each other comes out. And now they're yeah. kind of like, eh. and it seems as though based on the sequel, they are together until he dies because they kill his character off off screen. Yeah. For good reasons for the actor. Um, Don't hate on my boy Jeffrey but, Jones like that. But I think it's also like this visual aesthetic that's very interesting is that when Delia and Lydia first show on screen, you're kind of like, these two women kind of have the same kind of aesthetic. Yeah, that's why the clash <laughs> between them is a little odd because it seems as though, well, they're both kind of that dark, artsy, Tim Burton yeah. kind of thing. So I kind of wish there was a little bit of explanation of the family and the dynamics and just not so much the dismissal of of it being like well Lydia's just a teenager you just leave teenagers alone kind of thing uh yeah the the side characters and things that show up in this movie are so interesting because of how little information we get uh for example Glenn Shaddix is Otho I don't know. Do they ever explain what exactly his relationship to Lydia or to Delia is? Because Dick Cavett shows up as Bernard and they say explicitly he's her agent. Yes. So Otho's not her agent, but Otho doesn't seem to be an artist. He doesn't mention making art, right? It's, or he's an interior decorator. I think he's an interior decorator. And it's like this thing that he is like obviously working for her but they have such a weird relationship that you don't know if it has ever become if it's almost like she's emotionally cheating on her husband with this man he's clearly gay no i know no, he's, right. he's her gay best friend that's, that's what he is yeah. emotionally like uh that's no, emotional i think it's fair. otho is in sync with her about the art side of things, which yeah. is something that Charles has no interest in yeah. because Charles likes the sort of rustic nature of the house. And that's why he's like the, the office he defends is like, you can't change anything about this room. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's reading like field and stream at one point. So he's loving all of this. I think what it is, is like what this film is, there are these bits that work very well, but the threading that holds it together is weak. Yeah, which is, I think, a common theme in Burton's work is there'll be a bit of production design or the seed of an idea that you're like, oh, that's really interesting. Like the look of Edward Scissorhands is you see that and you want to know more about that character, right? But then it's the execution is yeah. where it all falls apart because I think ultimately Tim Burton is not a good storyteller. 
I think he's a good artist. Yeah. He, he can make visually interesting things. So it just makes it almost be like, just stick to short stuff or get a writer that's stronger than you that can really add to it. So talking about the production design, what did you think of the afterlife as we see it in this movie? Um, I really like it. I Was there a sense that the afterlife also included aliens? Why do you say that? Well, like the fact that you had people that had green skin. I th- no, I thought that was like circumstances of their death. Okay. Like, I think it was taking how you know people's skin goes like blue when they are deprived of oxygen or they bleed yeah. out, and it was taking that like exaggerating it. It was stylizing it in a way. Mm-hmm. So that's the sense I got. I thought you were talking about the uh, justice of the peace that tries to marry Beetlejuice and Lydia. I mean, yeah. But then I'm like, is that a demon or is that supposed to be a person? And it is a movie where, despite having a very distinct and specific version of the afterlife, and certain parts of it are, a lot of exposition is given to it. There's other parts of it where you're kind of left like, so Beetlejuice is a demon, right? Or is he a guy who died? He, I think he was supposed to be, he's a guy that died that used to be Juno's assistant. I That's not what I got. I thought he was Juno's assistant in the afterlife. Yeah, he was Juno's assistant in the afterlife. So, though. yeah. So, but then like, I think he's referred to as, is he a poltergeist? Yeah. Okay, so he is a ghost. So the question would be, who the hell was Beetlejuice before he died? And why is he called Beetlejuice? (laughs) Well, because also you talked about the alien thing. His name, the way it's spelled uh, in the film, is the same way the star Beetlejuice is spelled. Yeah. Which also made me think, is there an alien connection? Also, the sandworms, that's another thing where if you look at the setting, it looks like it's on an alien planet. There's like spheres in the sky. Like on the third moon of Jupiter. Well, I had remembered <laughs> seeing somewhere they talked about it. it was like on a moon of Jupiter or something. But then apparently the the Beetlejuice cartoon series goes a little more in depth and has like two or three sandworm specific episodes. And they talk about it's a place called Sandworm Land. So, but I don't I don't know if that's canon. Yeah, it's also like that weird thing of like the Beetlejuice cartoon, Lydia and him are friends and go on adventures. Which has to be another universe, I'm going to guess, <laughs> because the way this movie ends, it didn't make any sense that they would do that. Uh, but yeah, it's, I found the afterlife had interesting production design, but at the by the end of the movie, I was still kind of confused about, because like the ghost football team shows up in the Maitland's house, but they didn't die in the Maitland's house. But I guess Beetlejuice showed up there. It's just very confusing about where and when ghosts can appear. Yeah, and they show up because, like, Juno shows up and is, like, telling them to go away at some point because she's, like, I think brought in whatever was, like, in her office. It's very confusing because it's also sort of, like, shouldn't then the Malin people be constantly dripping wet? If that's the case, if they're reflecting their deaths. Because, like, the shrunken head guy and the woman who was sawed in half. Yeah. They seem to be stuck permanently in the death state. And you're right. The Maitlands are totally fine. They're, like, wet and then they dry off. Yeah. Uh, The... What did you think of the resolution of the film? Uh, I didn't have a problem with it. I think it just... It felt like broken off into pieces like it is again like because we never had a moment of like Lydia's parents like including her stepmom being like yes we're gonna live together and we're also gonna let you co-parent our child (laughs) because Uh, yeah I think that's another like implied thing I don't have a problem with that it was more Because let's talk about Beetlejuice himself. Yeah. The performance and his role in the movie. So first, what did you think of Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice? I think he's giving his all. I think you can actually see and notice. So for those of you listening and who do not know, Michael Keaton started as a comedian. Yeah, he did stand up. And then he did, I think Mr. Mom was his first big movie. Yeah, like was uh, like a stand up comedy person. Um that because Tim Burton liked him, he became Batman. And major like 
if you are around our age or even a little bit younger, you just kind of think he's more of a dramatic, dramatic actor. But in this one, he is, you know, he's doing everything. He's like going over the top. It was like it was getting to the point that it was a I, little obnoxious. Yes, it was obnoxious, and it was also getting to the point that I was like, okay, how am I supposed to like this character if he's always like manhandling? But are you Gina Davis? But that's the thing is, I see a lot of people where they go like, oh, Beetlejuice is really problematic because he wants to marry a teenage girl and he like gropes Barbara. And my read has always been Beetlejuice is the villain of the movie. Why yeah. are, I, are we? I don't didn't think I was supposed to like Beetlejuice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not like Tim. It's not like a uh, Jim Carrey in The Mask, right? Which is a comparable role. Yeah, it, this kind of zany, over the top character. In The Mask, Jim Carrey is clearly the protagonist, the one you're supposed to be rooting for. I'm not rooting for Beetlejuice in Beetlejuice. <laughs> I'm rooting for the Maitland. Yeah, the mask is supposed to be like when he has the mask on, he has no control over himself. And then it just also, I think it it floats between because when Beetlejuice is on the screen you can't help it cannot help for him to be the main character at those moments but he's not as in the movie as much as the other characters. yeah i it's one of those where i don't know why the movie is called beetlejuice yeah. other than i mean it's a very catchy title that stands out but when i think about the majority of the film it's mostly gina davis and alec baldwin yeah and i don't know what you would call that movie a uh, haunted house or something <laughs> but uh the afterlife uh but yeah it's and that's whenever i didn't see this movie until i was in college it was one of those movies that my parents would not let me watch because at the time they were still caught up in insane christian fundamentalism uh it's particularly the like of the these shows and things are of the devil so to them this was of the, the devil. devil having watched it multiple times i'm like if somebody is able to perform a satanic ritual from watching Beetlejuice, what I don't know what they got out of the movie because I didn't get anything out of it like that. Uh, and But when I finally did see it, I was very confused because I was like, okay, it's called Beetlejuice. And it takes so long until he shows up into the movie. Yeah. And then when he does, he like pops in for a, a scene here or there. And he is a central part of the climax. But beyond that, he's just not an important character. I get the sense... With the sequel, he they have made him much more prominent yeah. for the story. Like, there is an arc for Beetlejuice. There's no arc for Beetlejuice in this movie, in the original one. Like, he does not change or grow in any way. Um, He's the comedy relief in the yeah. movie. He's, uh, he's basically, like, the huge disturbance that you need to get rid of eventually, despite the benefits that he brought you. Um, I think he the special effects in the movie i enjoyed because they were analog they were actually there on screen unless it was like a green screen thing but even then they were using a lot of stop motion animation like with the yeah. sandworms and things like that and i think that it does have such a charm to it and it's this was three years after uh peewee's big adventure which employed a lot of the same types of special effects yeah and this is kind of, for me, the prime Tim Burton era. Not necessarily that I'm in love with every movie he made during this era, but when I watch them, it, it does remind you, it makes you do, you do feel like a boomer. You're like, man, it takes me back to like a time when movies were made by people who actually got their hands on things. Well, yeah, it's also a film that I would understand why you would have like a child watch it. We're talking about like, eight nine years old older elementary middle like, school kind of, thing, it yeah. kind of thing because like the plot's new to and not too convoluted that they would get lost but it's also not treating them as a ch like a baby that they would not understand what's going on well and the ideas are also like still quite original they're yeah. really there really isn't maybe something like the good place kind of goes into this territory with these ideas yeah but even then it was far more original because like they there's no mention of like heaven or hell it's just a bureaucracy it is a bureaucracy which is one thing that we've jokingly talked about between us how that is not my favorite view of the afterlife but it works in this element yeah. especially with the whole like oh we're gonna draw a door like on the wall in order to get to this place only for them to be like it's a waiting room it's a waiting room and they're just like oh and you didn't bring the book with you when you don't have an appointment yeah <laughs> uh 
Why do you think Tim Burton appealed to people so strongly in the mid late eighties leading into the nineties? Cause I would say this is really his peak. We're looking at Edward scissor. We have Batman after this, we have Edward scissor hands to a year after that. So think about that. 88 is Beetlejuice, 89 is Batman, 90 is Edward Scissorhands. That's a pretty strong three years in a row. Like, it's the camp of it, right? It's the camp while also kind of taking itself seriously. It's the idea, it's almost like watching a public access person who really got the budget that they wanted or was allowed to like do the filming that they wanted to with it. Well, it's he, I think he appealed to that boomer sensibility. Because there was that thing in the 80s, if you think about it, we're 20 years or so from the 60s. Mm-hmm. So people that were kids or teenagers in the 60s are now adults. And this is going back to that sort of, if you think about 66 Batman, yeah. you think about the Brady Bunch, uh, you think about a lot of TV shows that got remade into movies during this period were often from the 60s, yeah. right? And I think Burton has that kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like bowling shirt, palm tree, goth. It's almost, yeah. it's like California goth. It's is, like yeah. circus goth. It's yeah. like the coloring, which you'll see like the reds and the purples come in along with the blacks and whites about it. But there's also something about like the suburbs, because you think of Edward Scissorhands yeah. and like the way he portrays the suburbs there. Here, the small town America. And it's portrayed in this way that it didn't even look like that in the 80s. It was going back to what it would have looked like during Tim Burton's childhood. But it's also this interesting thing that we don't really get to see too much of the geography of the town. We only get to see it through the miniatures. Yeah. So, like, even that is not supposed to be an accurate thing when you think about it. Um It is from the imagination of like what we would consider Adam that he's replicating everything around him, but we're not even set for sure that that's the way it is because we don't get to go discover the town. It does feel very much like a fairy tale. Yeah. Like the, the edges are blurred so that you don't get the full details of like, is this taking place in 1988? Because technology wise, I mean, I guess maybe the cars would give it away. But other than that, it's not like anyone's playing, you know, on a Nintendo yeah. or anything, which would have been a horrible decision if you think, you because I could easily have seen, like, Beetlejuice possesses the NES in the house or something, and then they have some shitty, like, pixelated yeah, Beetlejuice. Playing it, like, with the sandworms being like, oh, God, what the fuck is this kind of thing? Uh, and so, yeah, it's, I think there's a timelessness to Burton's work, or at least... A fairy tale quality to it. Yeah. Uh, so when we come back, we will be talking about a later Tim Burton work and also where his career went after Beetlejuice. his beloved grandfather leaves Jake clues to a mystery that spans different worlds and times, he finds a magical place known as Miss Peregrine's School for Peculiar Children. But the mystery and danger deepen as he gets to know the residents and learns about their special powers and their terrifying enemies. Ultimately, Jake discovers that only his own special peculiarity can save his new friends. Uh, Before we talk in depth about this movie, I kind of want to talk about this large multi-decade span between Beetlejuice and getting to this point. Okay. So I kind of broke Tim Burton's career into three eras. All right. Uh, The first era was the I enjoyed this era. And that was Pee-wee's Big Adventure to Ed Wood. Okay. And Ed Wood's kind of, I think, arguably his highest artistic achievement. It was like a big Oscar darling. It didn't win a lot of awards. But of all the movies he's made, that's the one that got the most critical acclaim. Yeah. I've never seen it. Uh, It's pretty good. I haven't seen it in a while. I would need to revisit it to see if it holds up. Uh, But I just remember enjoying it a lot. 
so then after that, we get the, I'm starting to get tired of Tim Burton era. And that starts with Mars Attacks, which I think is a movie that when you were a kid and you saw it, you were like, ah, funny. But as an adult, it's bad. It is not. Watching as a teenager and I hated it. Yeah, it's bad. It's a mess. And that goes all the way through to like Sweeney Todd, where Sweeney Todd is like, oh, okay, this is kind of good, but this doesn't really feel like Tim Burton anymore. It has the aesthetics of Tim Burton, but it doesn't have the feel of Tim Burton, right? Yeah. Then after that, you get to the Please God Stop era. And that starts with uh, the Alice in Wonderland movie and goes up to present day. And within each of these eras, you do have high and low points. Like, that Mars Attacks to Sweeney Todd era, you have Planet of the Apes in there, which is one of the worst Tim Burton movies ever made. Uh, so hearing my divisions of his career, what do you think? Do you agree? Do you feel like you would make changes? Um, I would agree. There is this mix of the disney version of Burton where it just seemed like... That's Alice in Wonderland, right? For sure. Alice He's sort of like making the weird stuff, but it's for kids. But then I can argue that a lot of his stuff just feels like it's for children, right? I think he was his career was hurt by the advent of more uh, CG graphics. Yes. I think uh, we did talk about that of it being like there's something lost at the fact that when you can do everything with computers. Because when we were watching uh, Sweeney Todd, it just was so much zooming of the camera over false and Im- like cityscapes, cityscapes yeah. and like you know the underground stuff it also is just the disneyfied version it's i think it's just it's a lot of remaking where well, none of the ideas are interesting or original and it just seemed as if and i don't know what happened as if it's as if collaborators went like, I don't want to work with him anymore because everything becomes about that it came from him when it came from a collaborative group. Uh, let's kind of look here at his career. Uh, so we're talking that first era, Pee Wee to Ed Wood. So we've got Pee Wee, we've got Beetlejuice, we've got Batman, we've got Edward Scissorhands, Batman Returns, Ed Wood. And I think that's a pretty strong streak. Yeah. You might not love every movie in there, but I think all of those movies, there's a texture to them. There's a feel. I can remember very specific feelings I had watching each of those movies. Mm -hmm. Then we get to that second era. So it's Mars Attacks, Sleepy Hollow. I kind of started to get a little tired of him. Planet of the Apes, as we said, was a what the fuck is this? Yeah. Uh, Big Fish. That was the big departure for me. With Ewan McGregor and Billy Crudup and Brian Cox. And it's about the guy whose dad is in the yeah, hospital. Think, and that doesn't feel anything like a Tim Burton movie. I, like, if you were to remove it from a Tim Burton thing, I think it's it's a decent film. It's not. It's so schmaltzy and cheesy. <laughs> but it, like, it's, but it, it doesn't fit the aesthetic. Then in 2005, he has two movies come out. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Corpse Bride. Uh, I've seen both of them, and I don't like either of them. Uh, Then Sweeney Todd kind of brings an end to that era, that middle era. And I think Sweeney Todd is fine, but it's not because of Tim Burton. It's because of, and now I'm suddenly drawing a blank on his name, the guy who wrote Sweeney Todd. Oh, God, I feel like a piece of shit. Uh, The man who wrote Sweeney Todd was Stephen Sondheim. Yeah, I think... That movie works because Stephen Sondheim is such a fucking good songwriter. Yeah. And so the songs are good. Yeah. And it's and it genuinely is like it was rated R and it is a bloody movie and it doesn't hold back on like what Sweeney Todd is. But I think it also it is affected by the fact that he just CG like it's CG and he is refusing to change collaborators. Like, he's, like, he has to have his wife at the time. Oh, yeah, she wasn't a lot of this. And then he has to have uh, Johnny Depp. Depp. And neither of them are great performers, when you think about it, like, singing-wise. And I don't think Johnny Depp is that great of an actor. And the thing is, like... At least not in... Like, all the chunks of the movies, how many fucking Johnny Depp is in there? Yeah, he's in a lot. And, like, he doesn't add anything. He's just... In Ed Wood, I think he's good. 
Yeah, but Edward was during the time that he was actually trying as an actor. So, uh, that third period, we have Alice in Wonderland. I remember watching it and hating it. Uh, Dark Shadows. We went to the theater and saw that, and I hated it. Frankenweenie bored me to tears. Yeah. That's where I just stopped. I was like, I'm not watching anymore. So then he did Big Eyes with Amy Adams and, uh, oh, that German actor. Uh, why am I drawing? Uh, Christoph Waltz, which is supposedly based on a true story about the woman who did the Big Eye paintings in the 70s. Her husband did, yeah. Uh, then we have Miss Peregrine's, which we're about to talk about. Then Dumbo, which feels to me like a major low point. Yeah. And then Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, which has got, just come out. And I'm hearing everything from, oh, it's fine, to it's terrible. <laughs> so it's all over the place. Uh, in there, so in between Dumbo and Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, we also have the Wednesday series for Netflix, which I have not watched anything other than I've seen trailers for it. Yeah. Um, and that seems to have been a success for him. Yeah. But is that more him or is it Jenna Ortega or is it the collaboration? I think it could be the collaboration of the both of them. He's now having an artist that is younger and is apparently more vocal as to what she wants to see on screen. Maybe he's finally realizing the massive goth community within Mexican people, (laughs) Mexican-Americans, and is like, I can sell my stuff to them. They've been going to Hot Topic buying shit with my things on it for years. Um, so I'm wondering, like, are we in the new Burton Ortega collaboration era going forward? Could be. We won't know until after this film. Yeah, because I think if he does a third film or project with her, then I'm like, oh, okay, now we have like a solid collaboration. Yeah, going. and it seems like from what he's saying is he is enjoying the fact that she is correcting him on certain things, and now he's listening more because Winona Ryder had started saying like what she had wanted out of Beetlejuice. And that he started to listen to her more. Well, he had gotten in trouble okay. uh, just a few years ago for saying he was t- – it was kind of this anti-DEI crap that you hear coming from and reactionaries. Can, like brown people did not fit. Well, no, he was like, them. you know, when I was a kid, I would go watch black exploitation movies. And I never said, why aren't there more white people in these movies? Which is such a tone-deaf thing to say. It's like, do you know why the black exploitation movies were made? Because nobody was making mainstream movies with black people in them predominantly. Yeah. So they had to kind of carve out their own little niche of these like quirky little genre movies. It wasn't that like they were going, no white people allowed. <laughs> it was, no, this is the only way we can make movies where we're the stars. Yeah. Uh, so, but to me, that reads as he's just a tone deaf idiot boomer. That's what he is. And that this he's someone who got a way to be to make whatever project he wanted to make, and then got his fans to tell him how great he was. And the moment that his fans came out and were like, "Hey, I'm a person of color. I would like to see myself on screen." Suddenly he's like, "Well, I was I, like, yeah. I didn't ask for a white a white goth person to appear in the black split team. <laughs> but clearly he's changed because, like, with the Wednesday show. The Adams family appear to be Latino. At least the dad is Puerto Rican. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about Miss Peregrine. So Miss Peregrine comes between Big Eyes, which oh, some people thought might be like his return to Ed Wood status. It, he did win a Golden Globe for it. Good and it uh, no, Big Eyes. Okay. Uh, and then it also, I think, got nominated for some like visual effects Oscars or screen, maybe original screenplay or adapted or something like that. Okay. And then after Miss Peregrine, he does Dumbo, another fucking Disney remaking one of their animated movies in what they call live action, even though 90% of it's done on a computer. So Miss Peregrine comes in the middle there. Uh, what did you think of this movie? What a fucking mess of a film. I think I fell asleep like three times during the film just because I was of- struggling, man. Because there was so much exposition, right? Not so much. It's all exposition. It's all exposition. Okay, so here's the thing that made no sense. Um, you have three different UK actors doing American accents. Well, I do think that Terrence Stamp is supposed to be English because we eventually find out he's from that area. 
Yeah. I think maybe he was trying to do a Welsh accent, maybe. I don't know. But it, it was confusing because he did like a clearly American accent at the beginning when he's talking to his I think maybe son. he was trying to do like a Brit who's lived in the US for most of their adult life. And so the accents kind of faded a bit. But it's also a mess because then later on in the flashbacks when his grandson is thinking about him, he's like back to like a Brit yeah. accent. Of all the problems this movie has, Terrence Stamp's accent is low on the list. Uh, the problem with this movie is the script. That is the biggest problem. The dialogue in this movie is so on the nose. There's no way to interpret anything because every character exposits constantly. Everything is an explanation of what of who I am and what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and the stakes of the moment that we're in and what will happen if we don't do this and what's happened before. And it's just... It felt like... I never got a sense that, of any character. So it felt like a movie that was like, you know what? Harry Potter is big. But you know what else is? Like the Marvel stuff. So how can we mix yeah. Harry Potter with the X-Men? I know the peculiar children and like, it's just such a fucking mess. The majority of the time. And the, that concept is not a bad concept in the right hands. That concept could be a very enjoyable, interesting, unique movie. Yeah. But the problem here is that everything feels so generic and bland from like the beginning of the movie to the end, nothing ever happens that will surprise you except for I think maybe one death because the actor who dies, I thought was going to have a much bigger part in the movie. And I don't understand why she's in the movie then because she does nothing. <laughs> like literally, that Judy Dench is in this movie and does nothing. She shows up in a vision someone has. Then... She shows up in like in person, is has no dialogue, <laughs> hides behind a door, and then gets killed. Yeah. And I don't understand what role. I guess it was the idea was that the monsters were chasing her. It's also like how it's really it's you know what's really astonishing to me? They managed to make Eva Green, who most of the time when I see on screen is an interesting actress playing a role that like I don't expect her to do they made her annoying well she was too like cutesy and twee yeah and it's just it was a film that felt like it was made in anticipation of hot topic merchandise <laughs> yeah right it was. well because it's based on a book that isn't really a, a like plot book it was a young a YA book that the author used old photography that they had found of these children. And I think they maybe did like some Photoshopping on it. And so it's more of like a world building text of explaining this world with these strange children who have powers. Uh, I haven't read it, but everything I've read about it, it's not necessarily a film with a plot or a book with a plot. So that was the first challenge when they decided to make this book into a movie. Well, now they have to create a story and they hired um, a screenwriter who is, I, I have to look at her work here. Um, so she has written several films and they all kind of seem to be genre stuff. Jane Goldman. She is often a collaborator with Matthew Vaughn. Mm -hmm. So she co-wrote the Kingsman movies, which I, I don't think I've even seen the second one. I have no interest in it. Yeah. I didn't think the first one was that great. She did some writing on X-Men First Class, Kick-Ass, Stardust, and also worked probably before they brought Brian Singer back on the X-Men Days of Future Past script. Uh, she Her first solo screenplay was The Woman in Black, which was Daniel Radcliffe's horror film. Okay. I saw it and I didn't... It was fine. It was okay. Yeah. Um, and then... She is currently writing because Edgar Wright is going to be directing a Barbarella remake. If it's him, I trust it'll be interesting. But she's going to be writing it. However, Edgar Wright gave us Last Night in Soho, which was awful. I yeah. thought that movie was such a disappointment. I think it was just, I, it's, he was writing from a female perspective and he is not strong with the female perspective. I think this, so this film, 
felt very strongly as if they already in their heads wanted to make more than one movie. Well, but that's then the when it problem. came yeah, yeah. to production, they were like, whatever fucking ideas that you had for the second film, just put it in. We're just going like, to no, match it, it up. No, 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 no. <laughs> This film ends like they anticipate a sequel yeah. because they make sure to get all the characters back together by the end, yeah. send them off into the world. And you're like, well, of course, the door's open to like, who will they encounter now? Maybe they're going to find out there's other peculiar children they have to save. Maybe there's other they, monsters they, they didn't know about. It's too convoluted because there's whole thing of them living in a loop in a day that's supposed to be safe for them to live in. Well, I think someone listening to this, we're confusing them. Yeah. So I want to kind of like take you through the plot beats of this movie yeah. so you understand. So it starts in modern day. Jake is a teenager. It looks to be somewhere maybe like in Florida. Yeah. And he his grandfather dies. And his grandfather is found with his eyes missing. And Jake believes for like a minute he sees some monster or something. So his, his entire life, Jake's granddad has told him about Miss Peregrine and her home for peculiar children, which is located on an island uh, off the coast of Wales. And so Jake, now to honor his grandfather, wants to go to that island and see the place for himself to see if the stories his grandfather told him were true. Meanwhile, his dad, played by Chris O'Dowd, uh, doing an American accent. So bad. <laughs> uh, and then Asa Butterfield, who plays uh jake i believe is also english he's from london also doing an american accent i'm guessing they filmed everything in the uk but i don't yeah. know about the florida stuff i don't understand okay whatever i don't care <laughs> so they eventually do get to the island and jake has to come up with a way to get away from his dad so he can explore by himself and he finds the building and it's destroyed so i guess what all whatever it was his grandfather told him about it's gone now Oh, well, it's not. It turns out that there's a cave nearby that allows you to go back in time to the September 3rd, 1943, which is the day the house gets destroyed. However, Miss Peregrine somehow has the power to be able to trap them all in a time loop. So the, when the moment comes that the Germans are dropping bombs on the house, she can use her magic pocket watch and rewind the day back to its beginning. So the her and the kids under experience the feeling of time passing, but they don't age. Yeah. Everyone else on the island feels like they're living. They don't realize they're living the same day over and over, I guess, or they're not living the same day over and over. Not. They don't. Really, they get just... to keep moving forward. Uh, it's yeah. weird uh, because you would think it's a time travel concept that doesn't make sense because you're like, well, are you changing time every time you loop back? Right. Because you're interacting with things differently than you did before. So is that having any effect on the present? And I know that's just like a nitpicky nerdy thing to point out, yeah. but I'm not the one who put time travel in this movie and put such a convoluted, weird kind of time travel. And that's the thing. When you introduce time travel into a story, you really need to have the rules ironed out. So people understand what, effect if any do i have on future events then uh so jake goes over he falls in love with um uh what's her face uh emma played by uh ella purnell from yellow jackets uh her ability she's an aerokinetic so she can manipulate air but she also is lighter than air so she has to wear lead shoes or she floats away and she was the love interest of his grandpa yeah. And becomes his love interest, which is a weird ass thing to have in this movie. Uh and never really gets explored in any way other yeah. than just no, it's totally fine. Because at the same time, that means there comes a certain point when you think about the conclusion of this movie. They're all off the island now because the time loop is over. Like spoilers, like you think they're gonna live in the time loop forever. So they're off the island in 1943 because they can't go to the present because then they'll like wither and die. Yeah. That means Abe's grandfather is a young man somewhere in that world yeah. who had a relationship with Emma, who's now has a relationship with his future grandson. And I was thinking like, oh, so they're just going to like never go tell Abe what happened? Yeah, and there's a whole thing that like Abe does call the house to give him a warning about something. And Jack answers. But then Abe, well, Abe's the reason they know that the bombing is going to yeah. happen. 
because he's working for the Royal Air Force, I think. And so, but then Jake eventually does go back to 2016 where his grandfather never died. Why? I don't know. Because they kill the monsters in the present day. They didn't kill the monsters in the past. And I didn't think the monsters had come from the past. I thought they were living in the present day. Yeah. So if you kill them in the present day, his grandfather still would have died because the monsters still would have shown up at the fucking house. I, I have no idea. See how this know. doesn't make, like, <laughs> the minute you start to, like, like, sort of unfold this plot, it doesn't make any sense, which is one of the reasons it's such a frustrating and dull movie because you eventually feel, oh, they don't give a shit about any of this why should i give any shit it's about like, it i'm never gonna be able to catch up there's like, there's gonna be some new thing i don't understand and anytime characters have conversations it's never about developing the relationship between them it's about oh there's something i forgot to tell you or <laughs> oh i can actually whenever emma goes underwater and suddenly it's like oh no i can breathe underwater and i can like displace water well, it's not even that. It's just also like how she suddenly has photographs underwater to explain further the plot to Jake. And instead of, because it's like, oh, this is where I come to think. And you think, oh, they're going to have this moment where she needs, talks about how she needs to be alone because the house is full of kids. She's like, no, here's some photographs. That fill in a plot gap. Yeah. That I just happened to never mention that I had before. Yeah. And then like, uh, Samuel Jackson is like one of the main baddies. Well, because the the he's a white or a hollow or something. So, like, he's this weird thing that like there's something about the way that he's delivering everything. So stiff. That is different from everyone else, and I don't think it's like it's stiff. He's supposed to be like well, it's, comedic. He's done this before. It felt like Mace Windu, and it felt like maybe the Squid and the Spirit, which I'm really stretching. That Frank Miller movie, yeah, I where think... it's he's trying to do a genre thing, but he's also they're telling him we want Samuel L. Jackson though, and he's not sure how do I do contemporary modern day Samuel L. Jackson and this very specific character in this specific genre, yeah, and, I think it also, and he's giving them what he thinks they it want. It feels like what it is is like what I wish this this would have done, but they are a little bit too like scared to do it. Is after watching like uh. Neil, like Neil Gaiman's like a Sandman on Netflix there is this understanding that like we are not within the same reality within reality despite us saying that we're like in the actual real world like there is like this falseness about it that they accept and in this one there's nothing there's none of that that well, you kind of no, need th there is but it clashes with the tone of like the beginning of the movie yeah because from the start of this movie, I was like, oh, this doesn't really feel like a Tim Burton movie. This just feels like some generic director making a movie. Yeah. But then when they introduce the Miss Peregrine stuff, they want to start to bring in, because like the Samuel Jackson and his fellow whites, uh, which sounds great. <laughs> W-I-G-H-T. W-I-G-H-T. <laughs> uh, I noticed like the way their eyes were styled, it reminded me of art I've seen Tim Burton draw. Yeah. Where he has like the specific way of drawing like creepy shit. Um, and so like that's it was trying to mesh those things with this other aesthetic. It just feel like a, a mingling of too many different clashing styles. Yeah. And a script that was so heavy on uh expositing everything. That they didn't know how to edit themselves. And the movie is two hours and seven minutes long. And if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you know my policy on most movies hour 30 and we're out you gotta justify more than that yeah and this movie does not it it's... spends too much time getting us to the fucking island and the peculiars when it could have just had well, here's what i do i have uh jake and his dad showing up on the island that's the opening of the movie and there's your exposition well, oh why'd you come to our island oh well my granddad died and he used to live here and he told me about this place and everybody's like oh yeah that place burned down and then he goes there and boom, that's like the first 15 minutes of the movie. Yeah. We cut out like the first 45, right? And we get right to it. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to go without much saying. I don't recommend this movie. No, it is boring. It just, there's nothing visually interesting. Eva Green is in the film and then suddenly she turns into a bird and we don't see her. Well, there's, there's a very clear sense I got that Eva Green was like, I'm done. I'm done filming. <laughs> 
You can just CG in the bird for the rest of me. I'll do one shot on the top of this tower where I smile, and then I turn back into the bird. Yeah. Uh, and I never speak to any of these characters ever again. Uh, so we come to this point with Tim Burton having a new movie out, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Is Burton even relevant in American cinema anymore? I don't think he is. I, I feel like anyone who is raving about the Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice is probably heavy on the nostalgia. Yeah. I we would have to watch the film, but we're just we just after the after this one, why why make the effort? Just yeah, like it's on video on demand, we'll make a review. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I'm willing to watch Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, but I my I don't hold out much hope for it, and I also feel that the the elements of Burton's aesthetic that appealed to me when I was young are not present in his work any longer. No, and that was about the only thing that kept me hooked. And so by getting rid of those elements, I just don't really know what there's left for me specifically like in his films because of how CG heavy it is. Now, I've heard Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice uses a lot more like handmade kind of stuff, physical stuff. And that's great. But do I think that's going to be a thing that Burton's going to keep doing? No, I think they're just doing it for this movie because of the nostalgia. He'll do another season of Wednesday. Maybe he'll make something with uh you know, jenna ortega but like for me i think he's uh 67 years old 66 years old uh i just don't know what he has left unless he's gonna do some sort of wild pivot because he at one point he was gonna do that superman movie with nick cage and that fell through thank god <laughs> Uh, I can't see him doing like Marvel stuff. He was attached to make Maleficent for Disney, but then he did Dark Shadows and Frankenweenie. Um, he was going to do a 3D stop motion Adams Family, but then that got dropped for the DreamWorks. I think it was DreamWorks Animation did one. Uh, he in 2011 he was apparently working on a Hunchback of Notre Dame Disney remake <laughs> with Josh Brolin, and that fell through. But yeah, it just feels like you were saying he's so attached to kind of the Disney aesthetic now. It's kind of taken the edge off of what he originally did when we think about Beetlejuice. That yeah, I just uh I have no interest in Burton any longer. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Check the show notes for any important links to things we might have mentioned, including our website, popcult.blog. Make sure that you're subscribed wherever it is you listen to podcasts so you'll be notified when new episodes are up. If you visit popcult.blog right now, you're going to find a lot more reviews. September is going to be a lighter month than usual. Uh, we're going to focus our energy on watching uh, four of Bela Tarr's movies, a Hungarian filmmaker known for making very dense, lengthy films including his seven-hour epic, Santantango. Uh, but I will also be reviewing the last few years of Chris Claremont's groundbreaking X-Men run, as well as some solo tabletop things. Uh, if you enjoy what we do here on the podcast and over on popcult.blog, make sure that you check out our Patreon, and we hope you choose to support us. I'd like to thank our current patrons, Becca and Matt. They both donate at the writer's room level, which lets them pick one movie a month for me to watch and review. Uh, one of those movies coming up soon is a film called Quigley, which is a horrible movie with Gary Busey, where he dies and is reincarnated as a small dog. So be on the lookout for that review on the website. Uh, we also have patron-exclusive podcasts on the site. We're close to finishing up a ser recording a series uh, about romantic comedies, and we'll start releasing those episodes very soon. Next week's episode of the podcast, we've got two new films. The first will be uh, Jeremy Saulnier, the director behind Blue Ruin and Green Room. His newest film for Netflix, Rebel Ridge, as well as Japanese director Ryosuke Hamaguchi's Evil Does Not Exist. Until next time, you keep listening, we'll keep watching.